Three o'clock rock. We have a, a double whammy today. We've had life in the law um, just a couple hours ago uh, with Marianne Sasaki and uh, host Carol Mon Lee. And now a couple hours later, we have another life in the law. We must be doing a lot of law lately with John Edmonds. John a lot Edmonds, of lives. Litigator extraordinaire who joins us today. Thank you for coming down, John. Good to be here, Jay. You're a litigator and litigators are different from the rest of us mortal beings because they go into the crucible every time in the courtroom. That's a special place to be. Now, right now, you're involved in uh, some big cases. I want to get to sort of frame up your practice, what it's like. What kind of cases have you got cooking? Uh, currently, uh, major plaintiff's personal injury and medical malpractice cases. I have a case against Hawaiian Airlines and a company called Prime Flight involving a uh, paraplegic who was being wheeled down the jetway, that is, from the gate to the entrance of the aircraft and he was being wheeled forward. Now they, they have a rule out there in written all the, into all the safety handbooks that the fellow pushing the wheelchair, who's employed by a company called Prime Flight, who's hired by Hawaiian Air, is never ever to push a wheelchair forward. The wheels in front are smaller. The, their manual says be careful. It can catch on the joints in the jetway and dump the pa passenger out. And you're always to back it down, you're to pull it. Well, they didn't back it down. They pushed it, hit a snag, and dumped his paraplegic out onto the tarmac. Ta well, the jetway. The jetway. And uh, he had very serious injuries and later died. Now, uh, it's not clear whether his death was due to this, but he'd made an enormous recovery from the injury that caused his paraplegia. He was a horse jumper. And years before, in a horse competition, he his horse had tripped, fallen, and landed on him. And Ooh. he fought his way back for about 10 years heroically and was still a paraplegic, but had not a complete paraplegic, had some of the ability to walk. In any event, this um, threw him on a downward spiral. And, okay. uh, that's one of the big cases. That's the kind of case. Ultimately, if that doesn't settle, that would go in front of a jury. Well, it's set to go to trial now. It's set to go to trial now. Okay, how about another one? Give us another one so we can get the, an idea of the kinds of case you do. Uh, I have a case where a young woman went in, married woman went in uh, to give birth. Uh, and they uh, set her up for what any woman who's ever had one will know is an, called an episiotomy. If the opening, the vaginal opening in a natural delivery is not large enough, then the uh, doctor goes in at the bottom of the vagina and makes a cut either directly down towards but not to the anus or off at, at the side. You open the hole for which, from which your baby can come out. This was handled by a midwife. It was mishandled. This woman um, may never be able to have sex again and never be able to have intercourse, has exquisite pain, has leakage, uh, it's a mess. Can't fix it. Uh, fix part of it, part of it is inoperable, cannot be fixed, mm. and it's a hideous injury. What a shame. Ted, is that going to a jury too? And well set for jury. Okay, and uh, you got a third <clears throat> one for me? Uh, well, yeah, one that we just settled, which I can't say too much about because it, it uh, the eve before the jury trial, it, it settled. It's a suit against Queens Hospital and the uh, surgeon was our key witness. It was a case involving a low back surgery, which I'm very sympathetic towards because I've had a lot of low back <laughs> surgeries. And uh, it was a fusion where you go in and graft certain bone material from the patient. You take the patient's own bone, graft it, grind it up, and then reinsert it into the spine in a special ca uh, titanium cage. That part of the surgery takes about an hour. Uh, the surgeon who worked on it got all set to, after he taken the graft material and handed it to his scrub tech to ha or have it reinserted, uh, got all set to reinsert it. It turned out the scrub tech had thrown it in the trash. Ooh. And th that was a very hard fought case because Queens denied that it had happened. And we had our witnesses, including the surgeon, who said that it did. The settlement is confidential. Okay. It settled the night before trial. But all these cases involve hard fought cases, ultimately, and uh, uh, cases involving expertise where the plaintiff's lawyer has to really bone up on exactly what's going on, and the defense lawyer uh, or the doctor or hospital involved in a malpractice case or in the airline situation, uh, they're going to they're fight. And, uh, they always fight. They always fight. And, and, and fighting includes, you know, stressful experiences both before and during a trial. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, you've been involved in some very high-profile trials representing very high-profile uh, clients. Can you just list a few of them so we can get the level of tension involved in these cases? <laughs> well, I defended uh, former uh, 
Gertrude, uh, Miss Hawaii, uh, Gertrude Toledo, who had... I remember uh, that. ...was a legitimate, real Hawaiian princess. Her full name was Gertrude Kapiolani Toledo, and she was uh, Hawaiian royalty. She, uh, in a dispute with her husband, shot and killed him. Uh, they charged with first-degree murder, and I uh, defended her. It took a year and a half out of my life. Uh, I learned during the case, because she was very ill, that if she had been convicted, it's a man if you're convicted here, it's a mandatory prison sentence. They can't give you probation. And uh, her doctor told me it would have been a death penalty case for her. We don't, obviously don't have the death penalty in Hawaii, but her illness was such that it would have killed her. Um, that was a very high, very stressful case. But high stress is what trial lawyers do. You got to, you got to be ready yeah. for that. You got to well, do it. I want to talk about today. Nobody said it was supposed to be easy. Now you're friendly with Jerry Spence. He's a big I trial am, yeah. lawyer on the mainland. Uh, got, you know, national name, an international name. You've done cases with him for him. You've represented him actually. Yes, he he actually hired me to to defend him in a civil case <laughs> that settled. We didn't have to go to court, but. But, and I've uh, worked on a major murder case. With he him. has shared. I mean, he's a guy who goes into the crucible on a regular basis. He has shared his views of this whole emotional overlay of the litigator. You want to talk about that? Yeah, I just wanted to add. He had asked me to uh, defend the Marcos case with him when he was hired to defend Imelda Marcos. Uh, and my father was dying of cancer at the time, and I obviously was not able to go do that. It was during that discussion in part that I, I learned some of the things I'm going to talk about today. I've read much of what he said. I think most trial lawyers know what he has talked about. It's just that um, he was the first in the 20th century to come forward and say, here's what goes through my gut when I stand up in a courtroom and I, I have fears, I have anxieties, I get depressed, and here's how I try to use those to my client's advantage. Now that's what's interesting about this discussion, and I appreciate you coming forward and, and talking about it. Because the reality is there's a, there's a lot of macho in going into a, a, the, uh, a, a trial, um, you know, before a jury or a judge, the crucible, as it were. It's a really rarefied air, and uh, you are on the line, all in, all the time. You have to be completely focused. And well, you're supposed to be. That's, have you know, to, well, it's like being in surgery, to, to yeah. draw a comparison. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, you know, the, the lawyers who do this, they are very macho, very strong, very... Um, you know, uh, <coughs> strong-willed, and, and they don't talk about their own emotional reactions. They don't talk about this thing that Jerry Spencer shared with you. Uh, they don't talk about exactly uh, how, they, how, they, how they experience the fear and how they deal with the fear. And that's why I appreciate you coming down for this, John. Well, let me say first, um, I didn't invent all this. Uh, <laughs> I, sure. I give Jerry Spence a lot of credit, but it's been talked about quietly, privately, by many of us for many years. Jerry was the first to go public with it. And let me say also what I'm about to talk about for the, for the lawyers who are out there. Um, this doesn't take the place of getting prepared. You know, when I'm, I'm going to talk about some ways that you can not get so nervous or not freeze up and uh, some of my own experiences. But this is not a substitute for not getting prepared, not knowing the case cold, not being the best you can be on the technical merits. This is over and above that, so or on the side, or under it. What I hear you saying in there is that even if you are totally prepared, as prepared as you can possibly be prepared, you still have fear. We all do, and uh, it takes different forms. Let me take an example from the theater. We all know who Henry Fonda was, one of the greatest actors of his time. Uh, he vomited every single time he went out to, to perform on a live stage. Every single time, up to age 75, in his last performances, he would, he couldn't keep himself from throwing up. Now, what's driving that? You know, when someone is that good, it doesn't mean he wasn't prepared. It doesn't mean he didn't know how to do it. It's what psychologists call performance anxiety. Don't, don't go any further. All We're right. going to take a short break. All right. I want everybody to try to figure out what John <laughs> is getting at. We're going to, you know, have this cliffhanger. We'll come right back. That's John Edmonds, litigator extraordinaire. Here on Life in the Law, we're talking about the emotional life of a trial lawyer. You'll see more. Hello, I'm Stephen Katz, and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap, which comes to you live every Tuesday at 3 p.m. on thinktechhawaii.com. And then it's repeated again whenever you want if you go to the website. On our show, we will be talking to all different kinds of therapists, psychologists, psychoanalysts, psychiatrists, people 
who talk about the mind, the brain, and about different ways to find happiness. Um, I myself am a marriage and family therapist in practice here in Hawaii, and I hope you will join us because I've got a lot to learn, you've got a lot to learn, and it's a great ride. Thanks a lot. See you soon. Aloha. I'm Kawe Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland, here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday at 3 p.m. We address issues of importance for those of us who live here on the most isolated landmass on the planet. Please come join me Fridays at 3 p.m. Mahalo. Bingo, we're back. Three o'clock rock with John Edmonds, attorney and litigator extraordinaire. Talking about the emotional life of a litigator, really important. All you litigators out there, you should, you should listen to this because this is the real deal. I can tell you. <laughs> I've been there. So, John, uh, Henry Fonda experience, you know, having to throw up before every single performance in a live stage, um, it's not limited to him. You were talking also about football players. A lot of pro ball players have it. Uh, they cannot get onto the field until they throw up to get over the what anxiety. What is that? What is that? Well, the psychiatrist, psychologist tells us it's what's called performance anxiety. And it goes back to something very ancient. It's in our deep brain, and that's what we all call the fight or flight syndrome. You encounter the, the lion, the bear, the dinosaur, whatever it is, out on a hunt, and you, or one of your enemies, and you've got a choice. You either fight or flee. Now, in a courtroom, you can't flee. <laughs> and as a pro ball player, you can't flee. And as an actor, you can't run away. So you bring it forward. But it's a very ancient thing that is built into us. And with, with that syndrome, with the fight or flight syndrome, uh, mobilizes uh, adrenaline. It mobilizes a fear response. But it's essential if you're going to go into a fight. Prize fighters have it too. And some of them throw up before a fight. Yeah, sure. Now, we all know that about that sort of generally. But what is the fear of, well, basically, if you're back in caveman times, the fear of being killed. But it was more. It was a fear of not being able to feed your family, not get the kill, not bring home the food, and a fear of dying, yeah. either dying in the fight or not coming home with the results of the well, fight. Although yeah. at the moment it happens. You, you don't you're think not, no, all those Nobody's things. thinking it's about it. Yeah. It's just fear. And it's unbridled fear. Unbridled fear. And in according to the psychologists who believe in what's called the reptilian brain, that is the part of our brain that the, the basic layer, what Freud called the id, but was what was formed before any of the socializing portions of the brain, it was just stand your ground and fight or run and get the hell out of the way. Now you said something interesting during the break that I want to <clears> cap <throat> capture is, is that it, it's fear of something, it's fear of failure, you know, but all that that, that implies or possibly fear, fear of success. I said it with fear does, of success. Well, you've got, we've got to come forward. Reptilian brain, fight or flight, you've got to stand your ground and fight or get the hell out of the way, kill or be killed. Okay, so that's the reptilian level. As we got more and more socialized and as people thought about what is it that's going on? Why am I getting afraid? Why am I getting anxious? I maybe, I'm going to bring it up into the trial lawyer's situation. Walks into a courtroom. Uh, is he prepared enough? Is he this? Is he that? Is a judge yelling at him? Is his opposing counsel making unkind remarks? Is the jury, the juror snickering at him? And he makes a mistake. Makes a mistake. Okay. Afraid of making a mistake yeah. or but, being criticized but, for it. But the fear isn't just a fear of failure. That, that we all think about. But the psychologists tell us, and this gets a little deeper, there's a fear of success. And the fear of success is this. It's, it's sort of a two or three step analysis. The fear of success is this. One of the oldest fears mankind has, because we are a tribe or many tribes. In ancient times, the tribe was between 50 and 100 large. And the single worst thing that could happen to you was to be excluded from the tribe. Ostracism. Yeah, ostracism. We talk about banished beyond the pale. Remember in Eastern Europe, the pale was a, or a place where if you were sent beyond, you died because there were no resources. Being ostracized from the tribe was, an, it, it was so powerful, so potent, that it became an unconscious fear that modern men and women have but really aren't too aware of. Well, the fear of success is this in a, in a courtroom or in a surgery or in a prize fight or as an actor. The fear of success is by becoming that successful, you are distinguishing yourself from the tribe. You are setting yourself apart from and as better than the tribe. Now, you're expected to do that. You know, when I go into court, I'm supposed to 
do something in a way that is for my client but is good enough to win, which means it's different from what most people can do. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what people expect. Mm -hmm. But in my unconscious, and I honestly, I don't go through this, but I believe that it's true. In my unconscious, I'm thinking, don't stand out too much. Don't distinguish yourself from the group. Why? Because that leads to ostracism. People don't like that. And if you distinguish yourself too much from the group, in clicks this unconscious fear of success. Another type of fear of success the shrinks tell us is take a tennis game. Uh, a lot of tennis players are afraid of winning. Why? Not because they're afraid of winning, but because that's, that last point that they score opens the door to vaulting the net and taking your racket and beating your opponent to death. <laughs> In other words, it's the beginning of the real kill of, of the ancient this isn't just a tennis game with rackets and balls right, and you're lines. Back to the basics. You're back to the basic, <laughs> and you, you put that last point over. You want to keep going, and people pull back from that. Now, you know, we, you can't psychoanalyze yourself to death every time you go onto a football no, field or work. get into a prize yeah, ring no. or try a case. Yeah. But what you can do, and again, I before you, before you get to the the solution, because I, I do want to talk about you know the, all the solutions that are possible. It strikes me that the way we have set justice up is, uh, I mean, this kind of yeah. litigation, it's, it's not calculated to make it easy for the lawyer. He becomes the champion. It's, he's down in the pit in the Coliseum, and, and the stakes are very high. And it's he who wins or loses in large part. If the lawyering is good, you know, if he wins, it's based on his effort. If he loses, it's based on his mistakes. This puts a huge burden on him. And, um, you know, of course, we'd like to resolve our disputes without violence, but all those violent mechanisms certainly come out. All those old mechanics out of the DNA, they come out. So if we know this, why don't we make it easier to try cases? Why don't we make it the Coliseum? Why don't we, why don't we say nice things to him and say, John, you know, we understand it's your client that matters, not you. And we're not going to hold you responsible if you don't present your case just right. And, and the judge is never going to yell at you. And the judge is never going to permit anybody else to yell at you. We will give you a good experience in this courtroom. You need not be anxious. Why don't we do that? Well, our system is based on what everybody's heard uh, called the adversary system of justice. Because for everybody who goes in on my side, for the plaintiff, there's somebody on the other side defending. And our theory is that that clash, that very civilized clash, that very circumscribed clash, that clash that has got so many rules around it, even you and I can't remember them all, but that highly civilized clash is how we get to, to justice violence. and the truth. Yes, you remember those <laughs> coffee mugs years ago that said, in the t-shirts, said, my lawyer can beat up your lawyer? <laughs> well, <laughs> hold it, that's wrong. You're not supposed to go back to, to war in the streets. You're supposed to go into a courtroom, which is a highly stylized uh, battlefield, battlefield <laughs> coliseum. But it's stylized for a reason, because we learned centuries ago that the other approach, you know, true battling, uh, doesn't get you to the truth. Yeah. It, it, noblemen right. used to be able to pay for it. If you, if you could hire the, the right uh, uh, knight to go in and fight for you, and he was stronger than the other guy's knight, that's how you won. That's not what we think is justice. Yeah. So if you're going to have an adversary system of justice, uh, there is going to be a fight. It's highly circumscribed, controlled by an infinite, no, seemingly infinite number of rules, and controlled by a degree of politeness and civility. But the the thing I want to get across is for all of that, for all of the politeness, the politeise, the civility, the way in which good judges and good lawyers on a good day treat each other with friendly, it, make yeah, jokes. But under it all, it's, a battle. it's two guys <laughs> in a pit with a referee and they're trying to kill each other. And why? They're doing it for their clients. There used to be in ancient times what was called single combat, the armies. Would, and I think it was the Japanese uh, who did this, but I think it was elsewhere. Tom Wolfe wrote about this in his book, The Right Stuff. They would amass two armies, you know, thousands of people on each side. The generals would meet. They would bring one representative from each side, and they'd say, look, it doesn't make sense here <laughs> to go Kill into all the these field people. battle. And, and you two guys. You two guys <laughs> go at it. And they, they would have single combat. Each side would have a representative, 
and the uh, made some sense. It, now, it really does, yeah. and, and in a funny way, although somebody dies in the process, in a funny way, it's a lot more efficient it than is. having two armies yeah. clash on the plane. You know? yeah, the problem is, of course, if the armies weren't satisfied, they'd start having the battle that's anyway. The but the, the idea, that's the success the problem. Idea, yeah, <laughs> that, well, that's a different kind of a problem with success. But the idea was an efficient one. Now, courtrooms are highly evolved battlegrounds. And I don't think anybody's suggesting we do it differently. Interestingly, in Europe, for example, in criminal cases, they don't have the adversary system. They do not have a prosecutor and a defense lawyer in the same way we do. They have a person who's assigned to hear both sides. And the lawyers in the United States do not believe that it is efficient. You see a lot of innocent men, women, losing their cases because it, it is not being handled in the adversarial way. I've been doing this for 47 years now. And I have seen case after case after case, not necessarily where it was my client, where the adversarial system is the only way in which somebody who really hadn't done it or wasn't responsible, shouldn't have been convicted, uh, got any measure of justice. So do I believe in that? You bet I do. And is, is justice always served, John? Is it always served? No. But I think it's like what Winston Churchill said about democracy. He said it was a terrible system except to, uh, for all the others that have been tried. I think our justice system <laughs> is a good system and certainly better than all the others that have been yeah, tried. Yeah. But it's brutal and it exacts a price on the combatants. It, it, exact, it exacts a horrible price on the litigants. Uh, one of the justices on the U.S. Supreme Court, now gone, once said that the, except for being in a major automobile accident or needing major surgery on a major, the third worst thing you could ever have to be is a party in a lawsuit of any kind. Civil, lots of criminal, stress. Lots of stress. And I'm not taking away from it a bit of that. I, I know that whatever stress I've got, my clients have got more. But we're here today to talk about the world that lawyers inhabit. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they suffer a lot of stress, and it's a, it's a very it's, it's, it's difficult work. And it affects your life and your life expectancy, your health, all that stuff. I mean, if you're just a corporate lawyer sitting and doing paperwork all day, it's a different, sweeter kind of existence. I run into friends who, who, who are not trial lawyers. Are you still trying cases? <laughs> and I go, yeah, you know, you're going to live a lot longer than I am. <laughs> you really and they will. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, why would you pick litigation then, John? I think it picks you. I think it's a, a personality thing. It's just something that what I What kind knew. of personalities are attracted to I always to wanted to do. Something you always wanted always to do. Wanted to you do. wanted to yeah. be in the adversarial context? Absolutely. Yeah. The idea, to me, the idea that you would have a jury sitting in a box that had to listen. They can't get up and leave. You know, nobody can, no, get, up nobody can get up and leave. <laughs> and it, it leads to some of the worst, uh, you, you know, boring uh, storytellers you've ever heard. But they've got to sit there and listen. And it's wonderful if you think about that. They've got to listen. And so you, you try very hard to follow the rules, put it together, and hope that they will see the truth. Yeah, it's a, a great human experience. Uh, You've got to love that to do it, though, because you pay a price at the other end. You pay a price. Let's, take a, let's pay a one-minute price here and take a break. And then we'll come back and we'll talk about solutions. And when we come back, you should be taking notes. If you haven't taken notes until now, when we come back, you've got to take notes. That's John Edmonds. Uh, attorney, litigator par excellence, uh, <clears throat> here on Life in the Law, we're talking about the emotional life of a trial lawyer. We'll be right back after this break. Aloha, this is Maria Mera, and I'm here to invite you to my bilingual show, Viva Hawaii on Think Tech Hawaii, every other Monday at 3 p.m. We're here to inform, motivate, and entertain you. Join us. Hola, soy María Mera y estoy aquí para invitaros a mi show bilingüe Viva Hawaii en Think Tech Hawaii cada dos lunes a las 3 de la tarde. Estamos aquí para informaros, motivaros y entreteneros. Apuntaros. Aloha, my name is Kirsten Baumgart Turner and I'm the host of Sustainable Hawaii at thinktechhawaii.com. We air live on the internet and also on Oceanic Channel 16. I'd invite you to come for a fresh new show every Tuesday from 12 to 1 o'clock. I try to bring on guests that give us a different viewpoint on aspects of sustainability in Hawaii, as well as trying to unpack some of the difficult concepts of measuring and achieving sustainability, particularly with regard to sustainable economic growth and prosperity in Hawaii. Please join us every Tuesday from 12 to 1 p.m. Mahalo, aloha. 
Okay, we're back. We're live with John Edmonds, uh, litigator extraordinaire, talking about the emotional side of being a trial lawyer. Now's the time to get your pens and pencils out and write this down. Okay, first, let's talk about your, your first, you know, engagement with fear in a trial. Well, there was moot court in law school where I fought my way into the finals, and that, that was more anxious than fearful. Well, my but first, taking yeah, tests and going yeah, through yeah. law school well, is not yeah. without stress. But moot yeah. court was, you know, practice court. Nobody, yeah. Nobody's life was at stake. Okay. Uh, the first real trial I did was a, a general court martial at Schofield Barracks. There was a wonderful young man who uh, lived on Kauai. There's at the height of the Vietnam War. He got thrown into the brig for I, coming back late, some trivial thing. But he wanted to go home and see his girlfriend, so he took off for Lanai, wanted to see his sweetheart. Well, it was the time of war, and he was in a uh, uh, prison out at Schofield, which if you took off from that prison, uh, that was an act of desertion if you were already being held. It's a serious crime. Well, it was a capital offense, potential death penalty for going home to Lanai for the weekend. He had heard about me. I, I was only about two years out of law school with a big corporate firm here. and. Uh, asked me to come out and try the case. And I told him I'd never tried a case before, so I, he wanted me to go do what this. A moment. And uh, You couldn't resist. But, well, I, I laid it out. I told him what he was getting, but he wanted me. And they try to scare you in a general court martial. General court martial is like a uh, felony trial. And your jury is made up of military officers. And military officers, unknown to me, are ordered to wear their full dress uniforms. So that when they come in and take the bench, uh, take the, the what's equivalent of the jury box, they look very impressive to scare the hell out of everybody. And it worked. So they file in, and I pre probably prepared that as hard as I prepared any case. I remember sure, the whole thing. Sure. And 47 years ago. So they file in, and my client, understandably, just starts to shake. He starts to tremble. Now, I was, I was starting to shake. I was starting to get nervous. But something happened, and I don't take any credit for this, but I mention it because all the trial lawyers out there, or all the trial lawyers who want, or all the lawyers who want to be trial lawyers out there, need to think about this and have their own similar experience. Okay, what happened was I looked at, to to my left. He was saying to my left. I looked at the court, and I looked back at this guy shaking, and what went through my mind. And again, I take no credit for this. It was an existential moment. I thought, John Edmonds, who in the hell are you? to have the luxury of getting nervous. You do not have that right. You don't have that luxury. Get out of it. And I've never been nervous since. Now, I don't take any credit for it, but it was a professional realization that it wasn't I who was on the chopping block. You know, whatever I did or didn't do right, I was going home that night, and this guy wasn't. And it could be very, very serious for him. And. That, that went through my mind. I hope it goes through the mind of every lawyer out there who's either been a lawyer in a courtroom or is going to be one. We don't have the right to let our personal anxiety get in the way in a destructive way. I'll talk in a moment about how I think anxiety at some levels can help. I think Henry Fonda's performance anxiety gets him ready. But that's not what my client was experiencing, not what I was experiencing. I was just experiencing yeah, the yeah, blind yeah. fear. And it passed, and it's never come back. Do I get anxious? Yes, I get anxious. Do I get wound up? Yes. Do I over-prepare? Yes. Do I sometimes act like I'm anxious? And over yeah. But I don't get that blind fear. I, I, it converts for me. It does what it does for Spence. Spence talked about how fear is the primary emotion. We go back to what we talked about earlier. It's the fight or flight response. But in Spence, Spence says he welcomes it. He can't wait until the fear starts because the fear is replaced by anger anger on behalf of our clients. And when the anger starts forming, you can take that anger and mobilize it in the service of your client. You're at war. You are at war. You got, you got to win. Yeah. It's, it's the need to win. It's the need, yeah. the need to but prevail. All, in my mind, what I always tell myself over and over and over is, John, you get to go home. You know, at the end of this, I've tried cases where literally people don't get to go home. You mess it up, and they go to prison. Yeah. Gertrude Toledo was going to die if, if I didn't get her acquitted. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you have to keep telling yourself that, that you have the luxury of going home. And that helps you see where your professional responsibility lies. What about lies. Spence? I mean, do you find what Spence said is, is valuable for you? I think it is for all of us. Yeah, I think it is for all of us. Another to, thing, to turn the fear into anger. Well, it, it's automatic. That, that happens. Fear is the primary emotion, unless you let it just collapse you. And again, to the lawyers out there. 
some people are not cut out for this. And I've heard trial, great trial lawyers say, oh, well, you know, son, you shouldn't be doing that. I don't talk that way, and I don't think it's right to talk that way. I don't think any lawyer knows whether he or she is cut out for the courtroom until you've tried it, and I, I've tried it, <laughs> experienced it. And I don't talk from on high about this. I think each of us needs to come to a decision about whether that's what we want to do. If you're not cut out for it, there's nothing wrong with that. But if it's something you think you want to do, you need to approach this. You need to see that there's going to be fear. You need to see that it turn, needs to turn into anger on behalf of your client. And remember what I said at the beginning. None of this takes the place of rigorous preparation, mm -hmm. scholarly research, whatever you need to do. Mm -hmm. This is how to handle the trial dynamic of what goes on. Now, I have more I want to say about judges and how it's no accident that the judge is up on high and wearing black. Why is that? It's to scare the hell out of everybody in the courtroom. <laughs> now, I take nothing away from our judges. They're supposed to be in charge. But this is another one of these fear of ostracism. And I, I'm not blaming a system that puts a judge on high and puts him in charge. We need somebody in charge, OK? That's all well and good. But when he's in black and when you realize the power he has, you can get carried away by that ancient fear of ostracism. I don't mean you don't follow the rules. But you also don't and shouldn't become hysterical thinking as from the tribe. Can't I better those consequences. No, well, it can't be a consequence in your mind of being ostracized from the tribe. Yeah. You yeah. can't do that. You, you can be within the rules, but not be overwhelmed by this second unconscious underpinning. It's kind of a contradiction, under, overwhelmed by an underpinning. But you can't get overwhelmed by, by the force of the unconscious that's dragging you back, saying, don't stand out, don't succeed because yeah. the tribal ostracizes you. Back, That's hold got back. no place in the professional advocacy so, of a trial. So order. now you say the judge, and for that matter, the court martial panel with all their medals oh, are very intimidating. Yeah. Supposed to be. But, but what about your adversary there? Now, suppose he sees this, and maybe rightly so, as this, as, you know, it's a, um, it's a life and death match in the pit, in the, in the, uh, in the Coliseum and all, uh, and he wants to psych you. He wants to do everything he can to get you anxious because he knows that most people, when they get anxious, it's, it's, fi it's flight, you know, and, or say a lot of people, not everybody. And it's maybe the mark of a litigator. Um, but he wants, he wants to test you out, so he wants to make you anxious. And he's working on you. Every moment in the courtroom and outside the courtroom, he's working on you. He's got a million tricks to make you anxious. What do you do with him? Well, again, I'm not claiming that um, nobody knows how to fight like I do. We all know how to do this. I don't let that stuff get to me. I realize that there are, there are rules. There is the merit to a case. When somebody starts acting up, there are a whole lot of ways to deal with them. In a deposition, there are, every lawyer out there knows this, there are ways to adjourn the deposition. Guy wants to start fighting in a deposition, I'll take on the fight and I'll yeah, you have a, there's a right under the rules to adjourn a deposition, go before a judge. But you've got to be ready to do it. You've got to say, Jay, you keep that up, and we're going to adjourn this. We're going to go to court, and I'm going to petition to have the court sanction you. If I turn out to be wrong, I may pay fees, but if I turn out to be wrong, you're going to pay. Now, do you want to do that? You, you want to do And we're on videotape here. We've got a train. Do you want to do that right now? Because we'll stop. We've been going four hours, but I'm prepared right now to stop. We'll go to the court now. Go you're, talk to your You're attorney. intimidating me, John. <laughs> Now, turn, I, let me turn it around a little bit. So now it's not this guy who is intimidating you, but you see the opportunity to intimidate him. And you know how this works, because you're a student of it for 47 years. So do you do that? Do you, do you make those moves? Do you um, find those ways to intimidate him and raise his level of anxiety? You know, I try not to. Um, I've been talking here today about the reptilian brain, about what these unconscious forces are, and I think it's crucial to understand them. That's very different from the level of civility to which I think a trial should raise us all, and the level at which I try to function, and at which most of my adversaries try to function. I want to tell you a quick war story. I was honored to be inducted into a group of elite trial lawyers, and I went down to the induction ceremony. It was uh, down in, in um, Florida, I think it was. And they were introducing the top guys in this group. One of them was Roy Black, who had tried the uh, Kennedy rape case. Another was a lawyer who tried all the asbestos litigation. Another was a lawyer who tried all the tobacco litigation. And the introductions were made by their opponents. 
And to a person, the opponents got up and said, you know, I can't tell you enough about how civil Jay Fidel needs, knows how to be in a courtroom, how much honor and respect I have. Now, these guys fought some of the biggest, bloodiest battles in the country. And I've talked to some of them. They, they certainly will talk to you about the undertow of the unconscious and the reptilian brain and the need to realize that you're two guys battling in a pit. But in a courtroom, they fight at a very, very civilized level. All the rest of this is underneath. It's all going on. You can't ignore it. It's like a surgeon in there who, yes, he's worried about maybe his wife sued him for divorce. Maybe one of his daughters is on drugs. Maybe he's being sued in three other cases for malpractice. But right then and there, holding that scalpel and trying to not cut through a nerve and cut in the right direction, he is 100% totally focused. And all this other stuff that pulls at his emotions is put aside. And that is what the very best professionals do. And when I heard these guys talking about one another in that way, I thought, and because it's the way I try to try cases, um, I thought, you know, that's the high road. Now, I'm sure I've got opponents <laughs> who, who would, would contradict that. Who, who but, but let me offer you a thought, though. I mean, we have weapons in this battle. A weapon is being prepared. A weapon is being quick sure. and, yeah. and attentive, yeah. you know, being fully engaged during the trial in the crucible. Yeah. But another thing, you see how you react. Another weapon, a weapon, is civility. Because if you are sure. civil, you put yourself beyond, beyond being, pro yeah. being provoked. And you make yourself look good for the judge. And you, you raising the, the level of not only your, your own self, but your case and your client because you're civil. It's a great weapon, isn't it? Well, sure. And, and you've said something interesting. You talked about you raise the impression the judge has of you, or more importantly, that the, the, the jury has of you. Many of these uglier fights go on in deposition where the judge and jury aren't present. Uh, you never try to do anything in front of a jury that's going to get the jury alienated. With a judge, where there's no jury, there's not always the same. Sometimes you have to take a judge on. And you Sometimes know that lawyers I have. do. They take well, them you on know, I have. full tilt. I yeah. have. I've yeah. gone to the U.S. Supreme Court over a $25 contempt case where I thought a judge <laughs> right. was once wrong. But you don't do it needlessly, and I think you can do it in a civil way. A great example of it outside the legal arena is what's going on right now in the Republican convention. I'm a lifelong Democrat, and I'm very anti-Trump, <laughs> but I think uh, Governor Kasich is a, an exemplar of what civility can do to raise the level of the debate. And the way you, he has, has said to Donald Trump, I'm not going to engage can't you. Provoke me. You can't provoke <laughs> me. And he said something yesterday that was wonderful. He said, I'm not going to step that far down and go that low <laughs> in pursuit of the highest office in the land. Uh, and I certainly agree with that. Well, it's very demanding to be a litigator, John. I mean, first you have to put the time in and, and make, make, make your preparation. You have to be very quick. You have to be there. You have to be uh, appropriately affable uh, and appropriately civil throughout. And, and you have to also keep in mind that you want to win and you can't let your anxieties get the better of you. You have to have those defense mechanisms at play and, or, or built into your system. Uh, my question is, you've been doing this for 47 years. Um, can you keep on, and it's, it's got to be stressful at some level. It's so demanding. It's like, it's like playing a sport, but as an athlete, an athlete can only last so long. <laughs> there comes a time yeah. when you can't juggle it that way. Does there come a time that way for litigators, for you? It, well, the answer is yes and yes. I, uh, <laughs> it does for all litigators, and it has for me. I've cut my practice way back. I take five or six cases a year, major cases, I still love it, but I realize that they're, I have three grandchildren. I dearly love them. I've got a wife and two kids I love dearly and kind of want to spend time with them. Yeah. So I've cut back. But when I'm in it, when I'm back in that arena, I love it. It's not like anything else. And uh, I think they'll probably carry me out. <laughs> Whatever. You know, I wouldn't want to be on the other <laughs> side of you, John. <laughs> That's John Edmonds. You don't want to be on the other side of John Edmonds. Attorney and litigator extraordinaire here talking about the emotional life of a trial attorney. And, you know, we've, we've talked about a bunch of things. There's more to talk about here on Life and the Law. Thank you so much, Jay. Thank you, Jay. Always a pleasure. Aloha. <laughs>
Aloha, this is Maria Mera and I'm here to invite you to my bilingual show Viva Hawaii on ThinkTech Hawaii every other Monday at 3 p.m.